Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. So, I mean, you, you brought up like a war too, right? So, I mean, I think that, you know, maybe we're, we're not necessarily in it yet, but we might be close with like, you know, the whole Russia-Ukraine system, uh, obviously, you know, uh, Israel-Hamas, like that kind of yeah. thing going on. I mean, no matter what side you're thing on, I think, you know, maybe like, maybe call me crazy here, but I think that Russia has kind of realized like, hey, you know, I just said, I said it earlier in this podcast, money makes the world go around. But what's a step beneath that? It's energy, right? So Russia's pulling the, they're realizing like, hey, the US and all these different countries, they kind of screwed themselves by making these green energy policies when in reality, it's yeah. not really green, right? They're just, right. you know, whoever's, you follow the money, you see which policies are, are going to be enacted, right? right? So in reality, Russia's pulling that, that cog. And what's the US doing? They're pulling the monetary policy cog. And so because of that, you know, a lot of small guys like El Salvador, like we'll probably see Argentina, we'll see some of the smaller guys who have nothing to really lose uh, start to turn up and Mr. Brandon Keys, thank you so much for joining me here today. I always joke with uh, everyone in the beginning as I talk about playable characters, which, you know, the name of the podcast, finding people who can think, quite honestly, and see a non-playable characters. So thank you, brother, for uh, joining me today. Of course, man. I'm uh, I'm happy to be here and I'm excited to get rolling on this uh, this pod, man. I mean, I'm, uh, yeah, let's, let's do it, dude. I'm, I'm hyped up today. I love it. I love it. So you, uh, we just, was so we you know, it, with full transparency, we did recorded a pod the other way around. And uh, Brandon was talking to me about Bitcoin trading cards and asking me about that. I want to know about your journey here. And really, like you said, you you met a lot at Pacific Bitcoin. I was telling you about um, my first event, Pacific Bitcoin 2022. I I have to know about your journey and really getting into Bitcoin, you know, your orange bill journey, getting into Bitcoin and when you started going to events and when you kind of started in, ingratiating yourself into the community. So, um, once upon a time, I was a big shot, uh, ran track and cross country at the university of Memphis. So go tigers. Um, but, uh, coincidentally, all my teammates and I, we all went to different, uh, graduate schools. So I went to Texas A&M and a lot of them kind of went to different places around the country, but we had this group message that kind of kept us all connected. Right. Um, so, you know, we were talking, whatever. I was listening to podcasts. I was driving Uber on like Friday or Saturday nights to use that for my beer money and then kind of try and figure out ways to make that money go farther. Cause I'm like, Hey, you know, like, you know, it's great. I drive for these couple hours I get, or I drive, you know, four or five hours, I get a couple hundred bucks, um, which was a lot for going out and drinking in college station. But in reality, it's not, not too much money. So I was like, how do I make this money go farther? So I started listening to a bunch of podcasts. I started telling them a little bit about what I was learning. None of them wanted to listen to me. They're all like, dude, you're crazy. What are you talking about? All this and that. Um, except for one of my friends. Uh, his, his name is Dan. He doesn't work with me at Green Candle anymore. But um, he's like, well, I was like, well, I've always kind of got this idea to kind of like learn out loud, um, you know, like whatever it started a blog or, you know, Twitter account, whatever, like maybe we can like kind of pick the minds of some other people that are out there in this space going along this journey, like with us, because, you know, not only do I want to kind of start to do this, like, I, I know that there's other people out there that, you know, have probably found Bitcoin before me, like, I'm not this big, big time genius or anything. So I, uh, yeah, I kind of just began going down the rabbit hole. And I was trying to explain it to my friends, um, which made me need to learn about it more. So that was what I went to grad school, like 2016 to 18 time. Um, so I was kind of like learning about it then that was when, uh, Preston Pish was on the, we study billionaires. So shout out to him. Uh, that was prior to his, uh, Bitcoin only show. And, uh, he had safe and I believe plan B on back to back weeks. And then like some even personal finance podcast, I don't even remember what it was called, had talked about Bitcoin one random week. So it was like literally within like a two week period, I had like two of my podcasts, like have three episodes on that. And I was like, all right, now it's time for me to kind of look and look into this and kind of figure out my my way uh, around this. Um, so I did a little research. I found some articles and uh, they told me Bitcoin price was going up as well as Dogecoin. So I was on Robinhood at that time, which, you know, obviously cardinal sin for all the Bitcoiners listening here. But, hey, I was a newbie. I didn't know what I was doing. Um, and at that time, you couldn't pull your Bitcoin off of Robinhood, too. So even worse. Um 
but I, uh, you know, I kind of traded Bitcoin and Dogecoin. I got lucky. I made a little bit. Um, but then I always kind of remember this Bitcoin thing. I knew that Dogecoin was a meme or whatever, and I just didn't really understand like too much about Bitcoin. So I kind of just went down the rabbit hole. And then, you know, December 2018, when I graduated, uh, every paycheck, when I first got that big boy job, I just kind of started going into it uh, there. So it's kind of led me to that path. And then, you know, a couple years later, finally, I started uh, the Green Candle uh the green candle media company and uh did that um you know uh i guess like right after 2020 when i had a lot of time uh kind of sitting at home from from the job so and that's taken me in plenty of places and yeah i meet, met people like yourself and aladdin and a bunch of other great people doing stuff in the bitcoin space so um yeah if you would have told me all this was going to happen when i started going down this rabbit hole like eight uh seven eight years ago i would have told you you're crazy but hey here we are man yeah, I was gonna I was gonna ask you, you you know, you've got some big guests on the show, like, what was the evolution of the show? Like, what did it like, what did it start out as? And now you're interviewing some of the, you know, a lot of the, the big boys, and big girls on stage at Bitcoin conferences. What was this evolution? Uh, Green Candle? How did this kind of? Uh, come yeah, um, so it's, uh, it's been a ride for sure. So um like, uh, you know, when I first started off, uh, I actually started off doing just a blog and blog only. Um, so I started it at Green Candle, I think like April 21, I want to say. Um, so we started kind of just tweeting it out, writing blogs, writing educational stuff, su sub stack, basically newsletter. I was always kind of tentative to get behind the camera. I don't know why uh, I kind of had this. Maybe I was just like, I, I don't know, what would people judge of me? But I've always kind of felt like I... I don't know, like my personality kind of shines through a little bit better behind the camera than I can write, um, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But maybe I'm just being hard on myself. I don't know. But either way, uh, my my friend that I started this with, Dan, he, he was like, dude, why don't we do a podcast? Like just kind of start like doing that. And then we did a couple with ourselves. Um, and then, um, and then we got Cedric Youngleman was like the first guest we reached out to. And he's like, yeah, sure. And at that time, I think he had like a little over 10,000 followers or something. And we were like in the couple hundreds. Um, so shout out to Cedric, but he, uh, he came on and then, and then my buddy got a job where they didn't want him to do content anymore. And I was like, well, I like this. Like we built up a, like maybe it was like a thousand followers on that time on Twitter or X or whatever it is. So I was like, all right, maybe we have enough pull where I could start to bring in some more people. And then it's just asking, man. It's just like kind of asking the question, being persistent. I can be a pest sometimes. I'm sure some of my guests, uh, maybe they don't appreciate it at first, but once they kind of get to know me, they know like, hey, I'm like just trying to build this thing. They they appreciate the, the hustle and the drive. But yeah, man, it's just kind of like evolutionized from like, you know, at the beginning, 10 people listening to it and probably like, you know, there's just my friends uh, telling them. And then, you know, it's grown into this thing where, you know, now I'm, I'm lucky and blessed enough to get on stage with a lot of these people. And then when I go to these conferences, they recognize me, which, you know, is just, uh, it's a whirlwind in itself. So uh, actually, as we're recording this, I got back from uh, Bitcoin Atlantis like uh, less than a week ago. So um, yeah, it was, uh, I was, you know, the MC at part of the stages there. And it's, you know, it's been great. I'm hoping to continue to do more of that. And uh, I think, uh, I think big things are ahead for green candle. I'm, I'm hoping man, fingers crossed for me. Yeah. That's, that's super cool. What, do, where did, so where did the name come from? So I always kind of wanted to have it as like a personal finance, like kind of like, I guess a way to get, to get people in without saying Bitcoin. Um, so obviously, you know, there's the, the candlestick charts, right? So the right. green candlesticks makes you, means you're making, making money, whether it's, you know, what, whatever, like you're denominating it in, but I've always kind of had this vision. Uh, and I guess I'll kind of just say it out here as to, as to what I want to build it as, but I don't want it to be just kind of, I guess, like just Bitcoin and just Bitcoin only content. Uh, I kind of want it to be more on like, you know, all kind of finance aspects of things. So like, you know, the, whether I have a macro show as well called macro insights, um, you know, state of Bitcoin podcast, obviously I want to get some more other uh podcasts around money basically but that'll yep. be kind of my indirect way to orange pill people and kind of create almost like a media company like the finance uh barstool uh, sports of finance basically is kind of how i how i word it to people so we'll see i mean i'm kind of i'm hoping i can be on that path but i kind of want to make it like you know a little bit more digestible um uh, but 
kind of draw some people in with, uh, you know, I guess the, the other financial aspects, things if I need to. And uh, yeah, hopefully they, they me, uh, meander on over to the Bitcoin side of things uh, sooner rather than later. We want to thank our sponsor. This show is presented by Bitcoin Trading Cards, an orange pill in a pack, making talking about things that normally make you want to cry fun and easy. The scarcest and most educational cards to ever exist. Available now. That's so cool. You're, you're, yeah. I don't know. You're, you're really good at interviewing people. Like, I know you're like, oh, I was afraid of getting on there. You know, like, do, I mean, do you have a background though in like, you know, media or communications or anything like that? Because you like, you do, you do a really good interview. Like, that's the thing. Like, when I first saw my very, the very first interview I ever saw you conduct or do, I was like, dang, like, you just, you, you got it. Like, you just have. It. Like, some people haven't, some people don't. But like, I was like, dang, like, nice. <laughs> Where'd that come from? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I really appreciate that. I mean, I don't know, to be honest, I, I have an engineering background um, and I kind of mentioned before I ran cross country and track. So I don't know if you know too much about those kind of like groups of people, but generally speaking, they're, they're a little socially awkward. Um, right. So I don't know if it's just, I've kind of had the experience of being, um, you know, around a group of people where it's like, you know, they're not always like the cool kids in school or whatever. And I've kind of been able to mix in both worlds where, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm smart enough to, to know uh, like how to make things come across a little bit more clearer, um, but also dumb enough to ask the right questions and be curious enough to kind of, you know, poke into, to wait, uh, you use this jargon here. Like, what does that actually mean sort of thing? So, you know, I think, I don't know, it's like a kind of combination. And then, you know, too, like just repetitions, man. Like I, I'm in like, you know, I've been doing the podcast, both of them now for over 200 ep or over a hundred episodes on each. So 200 total. So over two years on both of them, it's like, you know, I'm now like, yeah, I think I just published like episode 116 on the Bitcoin podcast. And then it's like, you know, 108 or something on the macro show. So, you know, it's just like, you talk to enough people. And then you just kind of, I don't know, you just, you realize that everybody's just a person, right? Like we're all just kind of trying to figure it out here. So, um, you know, I think, I don't know, maybe I've gotten nervous on a couple of them before. And then I kind of sit back and I'm like, man, if I, if I was just like, you know, I, I, once I get nervous at the beginning, I, I kind of takes me a second to get going. But after that, it's like, all right, well, you know, they're all people at the end of the day. So we're all just trying to figure it out and educate as much as we can and, you know, have a general conversation. I love that. What, so the overall, you talked about the mission a little bit and like where you're trying to take it, where in terms of Bitcoin, I was telling you earlier, some of my mission of trying to minimize collateral damage and why I love educating people. And I, I love bringing people on uh, such as yourself or whoever is willing and gracious enough to come on and, and talk about Bitcoin, share their story. Cause that's how humans learn. And that's, they get emotionally pulled to say, Oh, wow, I have a similar story. Maybe I should look into it what is your, what's like, I guess, what's your calling or what's the thing pulling you to that really is driving you with the, of, of why you want to take it to where you want to take it? Yeah. I mean, that's a great question. So, I mean, like I found Bitcoin, right. I mean, a while ago and I still can't convince, convince my family to really get on it. Um, <laughs> granted, I probably made a few, few mistakes with them uh, here or there along the way. But, you know, to me, I, I think that everybody kind of has their own lane when it comes to like the content creation and, um, you know, different aspects of things. So I think, you know, what, what I've been able to, I don't know, like my personality, what I bring is a little bit different than, you know, what somebody else might bring. And I think, I don't know, like, I, I feel like my, re my message could potentially resonate with some other people. And I think that, you know, a lot of like traditional finance, the jargon, all that kind of stuff, it's really pretty simplistic if you think about it, right? Like, supply and demand it's like economics 101 this is what we learn right the the digital scarcity aspect but we can't like you know we try to muddy up the waters a lot of people try to make it more complex they think like okay bitcoin's like this you know the blockchain like what is that like it's so complex but in reality i just kind of want to break it down and like you know make it a little bit digestible and make it fun too right because i mean I think exactly what you guys are doing is 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 an awesome thing with the Bitcoin trading cards, like making it more fun, like collectibles, adding aspects of that. I think a lot of stuff in Bitcoin is so serious, man. Like I get it. Like the money is screwed. The money is, I, I don't know, this is a kid's right. show. So I was about to drop, drop, a, drop an F-bomb. So I won't do that here on your show. But I mean, the, the money is not, not a great thing right now, obviously the fiat system. But, you know, 
I don't know if that that message is going to resonate with so many people where it's like, you know, hey, like I get it. I have to go through inflation. Like I already hate my job. You know, I already hate going to work and waking up every single day. Like I come home and I, I have to smoke weed to turn my brain off and like battle the depression. I have to do all these things. And then I listen to this Bitcoin podcast where we're talking about serious things in the world ending. I just don't know. Like some, some people might just not resonate with that. So what I'm trying to do is like, you know, make it a little bit more cheerful, a little bit more joyous, like have a good time with it. You know, maybe crack a couple of jokes here or there, all while trying to try to educate some people. And, you know, I think like to me that that's where I have more fun with it, because I think, you know, I, at a certain point, the uh, the philosophical conversation, I think it's great. I think everybody kind of needs to go through that to realize like, hey, you know, I've been feeling this way for X amount of years and I finally figured out the reason why. And it's the fiat money system all right, now where do I go from here? I'm kind of at that, where do I go from here kind of aspect of things. And, you know, I kind of want to have fun with it because life at the end of the day is going to, is about having fun to me and, uh, you know, connecting with people, trying to educate, bring the Bitcoin message further. So, you know, I mean, I guess back to your earlier question, that's what kind of drives me is like, you know, let's, let's have fun. Let's have a good conversation and let's, let's educate some people, but, you know, not make it as daunting as, uh, you know, maybe, maybe some are, um, you know, I think that there's room for every, every single conversation to, to be had for sure. Uh, I just think like, you know, at certain points in time, like, I don't know, I, I want to sit back and have a beer with the fellas and just uh, shoot the shit a little bit, you know? <laughs> yeah. Dude, that's so, I love that. I love that. It's it. And it's, you know, we talked about it earlier too. Like you grew up, uh, uh, you know, cross country and track and I grew up doing hockey. So it's like, you have this like built in camaraderie, right with team or like kind of the locker room, right. So it's like, it's the same kind of feeling in, in Bitcoin a little bit in a way too, right? Like whether it's going to conferences or some of the relationships you develop. Um, what, what was your introduction to uh, just money in general? Like, what was your, like, as, as a kid, like, when was the first time you remember kind of being like, oh, money, like, interesting. I, I was sharing you my journey a little bit of like, 08, 09, and seeing like the both teams, like how it's red versus blue or red and blue versus all of us, basically. And uh, what was your introduction to money and kind of seeing this the system and, and being like, wow, like for the first time? Yeah, I don't know if I've actually shared this story on a podcast before. So this this might be Ooh. the first. Uh, I don't even know if I've told my parents this story. So if they oh, listen wow. to this, they might kind of they might kind of hear it from me. But you know, I do remember it was two thousand eight, right? So I mean, I was like maybe it was either right before that or uh, you know right around that time. Um, so I was like about to be a freshman in high school at that point in time, and I grew up in one. I, we moved to this one house in Austin when I was four. Uh, we moved from Chicago to Austin and uh, that's kind of where we, we lived. Right. So I was like, what, four to, I don't know, 13, 14 uh, age or something like that. So 10 years of my life, I was in this one single house. And I remember my mom sitting me down uh, then, you know, I had all my friends and everything and said like, yeah, we have to sell the house. Like my dad's an entrepreneur. His business was not doing well. Um, you know, we have to sell the house. We don't know if, um, you know, we don't know if we can afford to live in the neighborhood that we're in anymore. Like there was a bunch of different question marks. Uh, and then we bounced around for a couple like rental properties. My parents did everything they could to kind of keep us in the same neighborhood. So we went to the same schools, didn't have to worry about friends and whatever. Um, so, you know, I mean, I commend them for that, but I just remember this feeling of like helplessness at that point in time where it was like, there's nothing I can do. Like my parents are doing like everything that they can do. But, you know, for some reason, like we just are getting like this is getting taken from us, if that makes sense. And so, you know, from there, I, I just always knew, like, I never wanted to experience that feeling again. Like, well, no matter what it was, I never want to have that happen. And so when I got to grad school uh, at that point in time, I didn't you know, my parents luckily started doing like pretty well when I got to college. And things kind of flipped on its head and you know i was able to get a scholarship so i didn't get in a bunch of student loan debt so i knew that there was a lot of things that i had where it's like okay you know comparatively to some of my peers like i set myself up where i'm not going to be in a bunch of student loan debt like astronomical things and like you know maybe i could go to grad school and get that paid for like i got to figure out ways to kind of do that but i got to figure out what i got to do and then i got to figure out what i want to do with my money so it's kind of this like, I don't know, like long winded, uh, like scenario, but I always remember that feeling back in 2008, where it's like, hey, 
know, I got to do whatever I can to make my money go farther because I never want to experience, you know, what, what my family did. Um, and, you know, want to be able to take care of them and do all that kind of stuff. So that kind of sent me down to just a personal finance rabbit hole, to be honest with you. And uh, from there, that's kind of how I found Bitcoin, where I was like, all right, like, you know, what happened in 2008? Like, what happened after it? You know, and I, and I to be honest, I was never really, uh, I guess, like an economics guy, like in high school or anything. I didn't really care about any of it. it none of it really interests me. I was always like kind of like a math and science nerd, I would say. Um, but when I realized like, Hey, you know, money kind of makes the world go around at the end of the day. Uh, that's what kind of sent me down that hole. And, uh, yeah, now, now here I am like, uh, an engineer kind of in the, in the podcasting game, I guess. So, yeah, <laughs> Dude, that's crazy. So transitioning off that a little bit, what, so now fast forward to today, what is your, what is your favorite part of, of the Bitcoin space? Are you is it kind of the numbers? Is it looking at, you know, the flows of the money, the ETFs, you know, wallet adoption, hash rate, like where, where do you really kind of find your, your niche inside Bitcoin? The thing that, you know, I guess your superpower in a way, I guess within Bitcoin, everyone brings something different to Bitcoin, but what are, what is your kind of superpower being an engineer, you know, and that having that background, what's, what's the thing that really gets you going? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, right? I mean, that that's a great question. I think like more of my interest is is on the overall kind of like just macro environment, how everything is connected, right? Because like, mm -hmm. you know, I yeah. think like, you know, we talked about price a little bit here in, in this one, and we talked a little bit about it on my show, right? Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, it's kind of simple, right? There's a fixed supply of Bitcoin, right? The number that gets mined every single day is going down and people are buying more than are, than are getting put out. Simple <laughs> as that, right? So therefore the price is going to go up, you know, at the end of the day. And so, you know, to me, I think it's like looking at how everything has been interconnected and how like everything can change, if that makes sense. So it's like whether the interest rate environment, how that's going to affect Bitcoin, um, you know, the jobs market, like all these different aspects of the overall macro economy. And it's all kind of drawn back to money and like the monetary policy, right? It's like, you know, it's it's interesting how the, the Federal Reserve is kind of like, we're like puppets to them, right? They're pulling the strings here. And like, whether it's the interest rate string to see, oh, uh, maybe a couple banks break, but you know, the, the consumer's strong and they're still spending. So we can keep pulling on this until the consumer breaks. And then it's like, oh, oh shit, you know, like we, we pulled it too far and now we got to pull it back sort of thing. And, you know, just watching, I guess, like the human nature behind it, and I think that that's that's the power of Bitcoin right there, right? Is like everything is programmed into it, right? I mean, it's like on these four year cycles where the having we know it's going to come in this amount of time, right? And I think taking that power away from humans, that's where I like kind of I don't know dive into it is like just kind of seeing the overall like macro economy, understanding kind of how we got to this point, um, and kind of like you know being I guess a little hopeful for where we could go on on this Bitcoin standard, so. I don't know if that like answers your question completely, but my uh, my aspect that I like to look at is kind of just how like the overall macro looks into into Bitcoin and in just the overall economy as well, like seeing how that kind of plays into you know venture capital money and all that kind of stuff. I just I, the whole business side of things really is uh, I guess appealing to me. Are you, so are you and I, I don't, I can't remember now if we were saying this earlier in this episode or now in the other one, but are you a, you know, like, again, it's like the whole Jerome Powell thing or the, you know, Wednesday, the feds meeting and they're giving us their meeting notes and stuff like that. Like me and I was telling you, like, personally, I just kind of chuckle at stuff like that. And I'm like, I, unless you're like managing someone's money, I don't know why in the world a Bitcoiner cares or spends more than a second on that. And, and I, I, I'm from that world in a sense where like being investor, real estate, like we talked about, I used to follow that stuff, but now understanding Bitcoin, I'm like, this stuff's pointless. Like, this is just moot. Like, why well, don't I even, I don't even care. Is that, are you watching the fed, you know, meeting minutes on Wednesday or the inflation? Like, are you watching that? Or are you kind of like, no, I'm off watching other metrics, other things. How do you kind of come down in that, uh, in that space? Yeah, that's a great question. So, I mean, I watch, I do watch it. I don't like, you know, watch it very closely, right? I still have a fiat job, unfortunately. Yeah. So, I, like, I kind of just surf <laughs> Twitter to kind of see some of the highlights and whatnot, um, just to get a kind of like an overall sense of things, right? Um, 
because you know i think uh it, it's it's also interesting because i i mean like i said i have the macro show so i have a lot of like traditional right. finance followers and like kind of the traditional finance aspects of things so they follow it very closely um and just kind of hearing things from different side of things to help shape my own thought process so like if you ask a lot of people in traditional finance inflation's done we've be beaten it um we're just kind of like in a slow growing economy and that the drone pal is going to cut rates tomorrow and things are going to be peaches and daisies uh, mm -hmm. but if you ask a bitcoiner inflation's still running rampant the world's going to end and uh you know uh and, and all these things so it's, i mean it's like it's in the, in reality it's kind of somewhere in the middle um but it's interesting how wrong the market has been and how wrong like people that have been in this industry have been for the past like four years, basically. It's like, you know, I've followed it maybe a little bit closer the past four years just because of, you know, Green Candle and kind of like the COVID, you know, pump and dump kind of yes. thing. But, um, you, you know, it seems like everybody's kind of tuning into that a little bit more. Maybe it's the bubble I, I put myself into, but um, like, you know, I never really even knew who like the Fed chair was before maybe like 2020. I mean, I know it was like, you know, Trump, uh, had him at 26 Powell at 2016 to 2020. And then, you know, yeah. kind of Biden got him back into, to his seat as well. But, um, you know, I, th I think like it's, if people hang on this guy's word, uh, and I think it kind of highlights a, an important issue that we have right now is that, you know, is the United States in a true democracy if, <laughs> You know, somebody that is, you know, basically pulling, like I said before, pulling these strings, he's not an elected official, right? He's appointed by the president. And so, you know, I say what you want about Powell, no matter what side you lean on, he was the Fed chair under Trump and he's the Fed chair now under Biden. So, you know, he's going to do what he can to kind of stay in power. Um, but I also think it's interesting, too, that he's kind of like going on 60 minutes and doing his media rounds now saying like, you know, things aren't that great. Like we're kind of screwing over the later generations. And, you know, I think it's becoming more evident how much these, you know, people in power, whether it's Janet Yellen or, um, you know, Jerome Powell or what have you, are just straight up just like, you know, lying to us. And then we have, we all have the receipts on Twitter. So, I mean, to me, that's kind of what the, the more interesting and like fun part of it is like, hey, like this guy's full of shit, this guy's full of shit, this girl's full of shit. Like just kind of like pointing out that, opposed to maybe like hanging on his word and being like, I'm going to make a financial decision based on what he says. Uh, it's just kind of always interesting. I mean, cause you know, I mean, in the big, I'm a hodler, right? I mean, so I, I don't, I don't want to sell. I don't want to ever have to sell. And so, you know, with that being said, it's like, you know, I like, it'll maybe swing the price up or down one day and I could post a meme about it going up or post a meme about scooping up more stats at the bottom. You know, it's like, it's, it's like, what meme am I going to post today kind of thing, opposed to like really making some big decisions on, on one swing or another. Yeah, that's yeah, such a great point. Do you think there's anything, any like the macro, whether it's in legacy, you know, TradFi or, or Bitcoin macro guys, do you think there's anything that they, they miss, you know, like, as again, like it's sometimes it's tough when you're on a, on a perch and you, you've got a, either a big following or there's, you know, you're you're constantly running from interview to interview or spaces to spaces or things like that. Is you, is you think there's anything that they're, that those guys are missing or those gals at a, at a high level that they're kind of, they kind of miss or kind of overlook at all in your view? Yeah. I mean, I think that the biggest thing that they miss is that Jerome Powell kind of sticks to his word when it comes to the interest rate stuff. I think that the, the market uh, Bitcoiners in general think that, you know, when, we're going to cut interest rates and kind of revert back to the other side of things. Everything's going to be good, right? But if you kind of look back at at like different time periods when the Fed starts to cut interest rates, that's usually when we hit a recession. Is like so I mean it's the Fed is they're also run by humans, right? So you got to think that they're they started raising at a rapid pace. They're probably going to uh, lower at a very um, you know wrong time. They're probably going to lower a little bit too late. So uh, in my eyes, I mean, I wrote uh, this on, on my blog, too, and kind of discussed it in a few other places. But I think that they're going to start cutting interest rates in Q4 
of this year. But if you look at the market, basically the market, the bond market has been telling us that we're going to cut interest rates dating back to sometime early in 23. So, I mean, the market's been continually wrong. Uh, the pivot bros, uh, you know, everybody in Bitcoin thinks that something should have broken at this point in time. Yes. But in reality, look, I mean, the fiat system, we all realize it's like a charade, right? I mean, I always like revert back to that Wolf of Wall Street scene where they're sitting there, Matthew McConaughey, it's right before he starts beating his chest, you know, and he's like, uh, right before he's doing all that, he's like, you know, what? What are you what are you doing with your with your clients, right? You're selling them an idea on this stock, right? Because you don't know if it's going to go up or not. You don't know if they're going to make money. It's all a charade. It's fugazi, fugazi, you know, it's yes. kind of like the expression he uses. And, you know, in reality, that's kind of, you know, where we're at is like people think that the market is like not making any sense. And a lot of people, if you look at the macro factors, you look at, you know, consumer spending, like job markets, like they're like, you know, things have to be worse than what, what all these things are saying. But in reality, it's we, we've been living in a charade uh, this entire time. It's just, we've finally seen it. And that that's what's making Bitcoiners kind of being like, well, this has to fail at some point in time. In reality, I think the charade is going to keep going on for a little bit longer. And that they'll they'll cut interest rates probably like later this year or maybe not even until 24 because you know it's just keeping up the facade that they're trying to fight inflation even though the traditional finance thinks inflation's done and uh you know the bitcoin space thinks inflation's running rampant so i mean i think the overall macro people are thinking that it's uh they're gonna cut uh, a lot quicker than they are and i think like bitcoiners are missing that as well man that's fascinating i i love that i, I wanted your take on this too like what you like, I think about 1971, I mean, 64 too, right? We start taking the the silver out of, out of our coins and then 71, which is a precursor to 71, obviously. And, and there's many things before that too, but 71, it's like, to me, I'm like, how do we not go to war? Like, how is there not a world war? And it, I guess, you know, our military was bigger than everyone already at that point. It was probably our, like, yeah, it was tough, but like, how do you, like, you just got rug pulled, like every country just got rug pulled and you just sat back and took it. And I, it's kind of like a microcosm of, I feel like everything, like Americans, we, government just does whatever. We just take it. We just don't, we don't, no one stands up and does anything and they just keep running you over. It's just like, at what point and where I'm getting at is you were just saying like, there's a lot of people missing this and like, where, where do the tracks go out? I mean, I feel like at some point, whether it's the, the baby boomer started retiring, you know, five, six, seven, eight years ago, hitting 70 and a half, and they got to start taking money out of the pension. I mean, the, the debt exponentially just keeps going up at some point. You feel like, I mean, it, it, the, the tracks are, are out. There's, there's warning signs everywhere. And it just feels like they can keep papering over everything and seemingly into oblivion. I mean, do you have any inkling? Like, what are your things where you're like, hey, if that happens or that, like it's no go zone, like everything just starts. I, that to me is just, I, I still, I still think 2016 or 2015, I was, I was waiting for like a double, like, a, you know, a dead cat bounce and like, oh, we're going back into GFC, you know, whatever. What are your thoughts on just like where we are in this, in this game right now? Yeah. I mean, that's a great question. So, I mean, you, you brought up like a war too, right? So, I mean, I think that, you know, maybe we're, we're not necessarily in it yet, but we might be close with like, you know, the whole Russia, Ukraine system, uh, obviously, you know, uh, Israel, Hamas, like that kind of yeah. thing going on. I mean, no matter what side of your thing on, I think, you know, maybe like, maybe call me crazy here, but I think that Russia has kind of realized like, hey, you know, I just said, I said it earlier in this podcast, money makes the world go around. But what's a step beneath that? It's energy, right? So mm -hmm. Russia's pulling the, they're realizing like, hey, the US and all these different countries, they kind of screwed themselves by making these green energy policies when in reality, it's yeah. not really green, right? They're just, right. you know, whoever's, you follow the money, you see which policies are, are going to be enacted, right? right? So in reality, Russia's pulling that, that cog. And what's the US doing? They're pulling the monetary policy cog. And so because of that, you know, a lot of small guys like El Salvador, like we'll probably see Argentina, we'll see some of the smaller guys who have nothing to really lose uh, start to turn up and maybe go on a Bitcoin standard or kind of get off the dollar, whatever yeah. route they take. And a lot of countries are going to try to get, get away from the dollar and more transactions are going to slowly kind of get away from it. Um, and a lot of these, like you know, like third world countries are going to realize like, hey, the U.S., got built on this system where, you know, the inflation was running so rampant that they made a lot of these systems not as good as they could have been. 
And if we get on more of like a hard money system, you know, like these third world countries, they basically have, you know, a blank canvas, if you kind of think about it, right? I mean, like countries like Brazil, very energy dense and like a part of BRICS, like a lot of these countries are super, super energy dense and just they haven't really tapped into those markets yet. And so what I think is going to happen is like the US, we're going to keep inflating away the currency. And then what's going to happen, right? The baby boomers are going to start to retire here soon. And what's something that is a Ponzi that's going to be running out? Social Security. So people are going to try to be relying on Social Security. They're going to have to be working longer. I mean, it's just like a, it's a never ending cycle that that's going to continue to continue to break. But I think we're going to we're, we're not quite there yet because, you know, I, until like the American dream of buying your own personal house is basically a gone and forgotten kind of aspect of things. I, that's where I think like things are going to break in the Americas. We're not there yet because in the U S we have that 30 year fixed, uh, kind of thing where it's like a lot of places around the globe, they don't have that. They have like floating variable True. rates and a lot of different stuff like that. So I think until that breaks where it's like the average house, you can't basically can't buy it unless you're like, you know, working uh, until you're 40 with your wife, uh, and you guys are both consistently saving up. And uh, you don't have any kids. And that's kind of like, you know, until basically the engineer and the nurse, that couple cannot buy a house, I think, um, you know, and I think that's, that's when it will break. And I, I think we're, we're honestly kind of getting towards that, right? Because I mean, I, I mean, if we want to get into housing a little bit, I know you're, you have a real estate background, but you know, yeah. we saw like a housing inflate like crazy, um, you know, this since since 2020. And then, you know, now, like, interest rates are making uh personal mortgages, probably like in the fours to five, maybe 6%. Um, and, you know, a couple of years ago, they were at, you know, I got my house that I'm sitting in here under 3%, um, you know, which is like absolutely insane. And, you know, I think like, until like, you know, we if we once we lower the interest rates, and the personal house is just basically unaffordable. I think that's when kind of the whole system collapses. But you know, we also have we have products here that, you know, you could put like three and a half percent down. My next theory is they're going to start coming out with more products where it's like zero percent down and people are just going to get into debt up to their eyeballs and then get house poor. And that's kind of like, you know, how how things are going to play out here in the U.S. I don't think we're there yet, uh, but I, you know, I mean, as Powell said, we're all kind of on a slippery slope and we're screwing a lot of the later generations. So, you know, that's like kind of a long winded answer, but. I think like there's kind of two things at play here, like what's going on abroad with like the potential like energy versus monetary policy war that we're in with like Russia and the BRICS nations. And then the screw ups that we're making at home right now, where it's like, you know, a lot of people are getting pissed off and, you know, having to, you know, work a job and then drive Uber on, on during the weeknights and just like, you know, work two jobs or do something like that. I, I just think like, you know, that's not really a sustainable path long term. Um, and where do we go from there? I don't know. Like if we were going to try to, yeah, I guess, make a case for the dollar, I, it, it would be pretty tough to do at this point in time. It, it's, it's, it's wild because it's just like Bitcoin, the dollar has a network effect, right? And it's, it seems that people, whether it's education happening around the world with, with us or, or BRICS happening, you know, China and Russia, not uh, buying treasuries or whatever it is, it just, it seems that the, yeah, there, there. Some are able to paper over a lot of this. I don't, I still, is beyond me. But they, the network of the dollar is losing strength now. It's still massive, but it's losing strength. You mentioned the, the loans too. Do you think? What do you think the possibilities of you know fifty year, hundred year loans coming out? I, I think they have the, those in some parts of the world, but I can, I just feel like we'll see those in the next in the decade here in America. <laughs> I honestly, like, I wouldn't doubt that either. Like, I mean, I, I brought up the 0% down, you know, yeah, obviously like, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you, th you think, I mean, they have those products for like the VA, right? Like uh, if you're a, a military veteran, yes. they have some of those products out already. I wouldn't be surprised if they become more mainstream or if, you know, people just kind of get in the, you know, aspect of like, Hey, you have a family house, you know, like you have multiple generations living under one roof. And those multiple generations have to basically pay off that house because they can't afford to move anywhere else. Um, so 
you know, I wouldn't be surprised if that kind of comes comes through. And, you know, we're seeing some of those crazy products kind of come out where it's like Rocket Mortgage is doing a lot of stuff like that. Uh, no free ads or anything like that. But I wouldn't, from what I can yeah. tell, it's like, you know, they just fee you to death um, from yeah. what, I've, what I've seen a lot of those things. And so I think that those things are going to continue. A lot of those products are going to come out. Um, but, you know, I actually just had a CJ Constantinos on, on my podcast and he's trying to make uh, a case to make uh, something like a, more of like a Bitcoin back mortgage. So you don't have to sell your Bitcoin to necessarily uh, purchase a home. I think like that's one way to escape it. But I mean, to be honest, like not enough people own Bitcoin in order for that to be like a super, super mainstream product, a project to, you know, save the housing market, so to speak. I think too many people are just like kind of ignorant of where it's going. But I think, you know, a lot of innovation is going to be ahead, especially in the housing market. Right. I think yes. I think maybe products like that, like I just mentioned, and I think, uh, you know, um, like utilizing Bitcoin miners to heat any aspect of your home. Like I'm in Tampa, Florida, right? So, I mean, it's, it's hot here. So I don't need like a, a heater necessarily at all, uh, maybe one or two days a year uh, in order to kind of heat my home. But what I do need is hot water, right? I like taking a hot shower. I like kind of doing those things. So utilizing Bitcoin miners to kind of cut some of those costs and, you know, kind of innovate in that aspect, I think that's going to be kind of another cog to fall in housing, whether it's, you know, ut utilizing it for a water heater, um, you know, heating your home, that kind of thing. I think like those kind of aspects are going to make people who aren't Bitcoiners just kind of see how valuable Bitcoin can be, because it's like, not only am I, all right, I'm utilizing heat that I was normally going to utilize, but now I'm, I'm getting Bitcoin back for it. Are you kidding me? Like that's, that's genius, right? Uh, um, so I think, you know, there's going to be a lot of delays and, you know, the way I kind of see us moving to a Bitcoin standard is hopefully a slow and steady, steady route <laughs> where it's like, we kind of do a lot of these things to help mitigate, uh, the problems that are kind of like pushing them down until eventually, you know, we just get to like a full fledged Bitcoin standard, um, where it's like, we're, we're util utilizing Bitcoin, uh, to transact, pay bills, pay contractors, do whatever. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it, of course, that's not going to be met with without some resistance from the people in power. So um, I think, you know, the, the, the long story short, I think, you know, what you want as an American is to kind of have the people in power not deflate away the dollar and kind of make it a slower transition, make it difficult for Bitcoiners to Oh, not difficult to, for them to transact or anything like that, but make it difficult for Bitcoin to kind of become uh, the global reserve currency until Bitcoin is ready. Because let's be honest here, like as as it sits today, Bitcoin is not ready to onboard 8 billion people. Um, but I think, you know, give it some time. I trust in these devs that they can they can find out some solutions. Um, and a lot of innovative projects are happening. A lot of building can happen. And I think we'll get there, but I think like, you know, as it stands right now, I want to see like a slow transition over. And so I, you know, although there is a bunch of macro factors and a lot of, you know, potential bad things underneath the hood, um, I still think we could get to from point A to point B, hopefully soundly. It's, it's so, it's so funny to say that. I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. Like you said, it's, it has to really be this transition off. You can't just. You know, the fiat debt based legacy monetary Titanic is slowly slipping beneath the waves and you can't just have like the whole entire boat just jump all at once into the life rafts like you can't it's just you can't do that, you know, so one at a time, one at a time on board, you know, one wallet a, a second, one wallet a minute, whatever it is, right. So like, I, I couldn't agree more, it has to be this transition. And it was funny that you I was listening to Peter Schiff the other day on one of the spaces he was on like, Mario Knopfel, like one of those, you know, goofball spaces they have going on doing talking about something and they had him in there. And, and they're like, you know, what, you know, what do you, what do you think that uh, Bitcoin will be viable then? And he's like, well, when I can, and he admitted, you know, the, the quiet part out loud, I guess, which is like, well, when I, everything's denominated in, in Satoshi's or in, in Bitcoin, like when I can buy everything in Bitcoin, and it's like, well, I mean, technically you can right now, Peter, and that's the Bitcoiner answer, but also like, that is the answer in a way, right? But it's just education and it's us continuing down this path of educating, putting out content, 
you know, indoctrinating people, uh, incepting it, you know, whatever it is, or just straight up education or people going through good times and number go up or bad times and Canadian trucker events. Like these things have to kind of happen, but the guy who's, you know, quote unquote against it so much is giving you the the plan right there. He's like, well, when everything's denominated, which like you mentioned, it's going to happen. It's going to be this transition over time here as in where I think this is my kind of question to you kind of bringing this, this part together, which is, do you think that we, I've, I've thought of this as like the baby boom or like the hippie bubble I've been calling it where you have this, the fourth turning is really uh, this, this bubble of all the people that are 70 and up in power at every level of society, you know, whether it's academia or government or, or you name it institution. And, and they're all going to sunset here in the next five, 10 years, 12 years, they're going to be gone. And you're gonna have this transition where it's gonna be almost like we weren't even be able to recognize what's going on. But do we elect Bitcoiners? Are they in places of power over the next handful of years where a lot of this almost is moot? A lot of the things you and I think about or Bitcoiners think about and talk about, I feel like doesn't even happen in a way just because we're gonna be the ones in power or people like us. We're gonna elect those people and it's just gonna be like a moot point. Like, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think, I don't know, man. I don't know if you just saw like the recent RFK uh, kind of speech when he was at, um, I think it was like ETH Denver or something, but mm -hmm. he was like, ah, I spoke at, you know, the Bitcoin conference in Miami. And after that conference, like I bought a bunch of Bitcoin after speaking at this conference, like I'm going to yeah. buy a bunch of ETH. So, I mean, like to me, it's, it's, we need to get Bitcoiners, I guess, like, I, I guess understanding uh, or uh, in power to that aspect, we can't try to orange pill traditional uh, politicians. Because at the end of the day, like yeah. politicians, right? I mean, they they gotta they gotta uh, fund their campaigns. They got money that they need to get, right? I mean, and, and these shitcoin companies, they're gonna they have the money, right? I mean, that's <laughs> that's what we kind of saw in the last bull run. Is like you can market a coin and put blockchain behind something, and yeah. that valuation will go from zero to a couple billion pretty damn quick. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's what, that's what kind of worries me here. And like, but you know, at the same time, we also saw, um, like during the midterm elections, I don't know if you were on space as much then, but, and like around 2022, we were getting a lot of, uh, you know, politicians that realized, Hey, Hey, I tweet about Bitcoin or I go in this Bitcoin space. My follow count goes from like a thousand to 10 real quick. Like, and people start reaching out to me and that kind of thing. So, I think like they kind of know, but they don't right now. And I still think like there's an education and like a knowledge gap behind it, um, you know, and, and I think like, to be honest, like RFK, like, you know, I applaud him for trying to say the quiet part out loud where he wants to, you know, denominate the dollar in and uh, back it by hard assets. But at the end of the day, like, you know, he, he said he wanted to back the dollar by Bitcoin, gold, real estate, like all these different hard <laughs> assets. I just think we're too far gone at this point in the fiat currency space. Like, how do we even implement that? And then if we do it behind multiple hard assets, like, what does that even look like? And to be honest, like, it's four-year cycles. So, like, in a four-year cycle, this is not going to really, like, change anything, right? I mean, like, we, we see it all the time, right? It's, you know, the first two years, the person kind of comes in and, and says, like, what they needed to say and, like, tries to do what they can and then that year three, they realize like, hey, I'm not going to be able to do all these things. Now it's trying to start a campaign to do whatever I can do um, to try to set up for the fourth year where I'm basically going to be campaigning to be reelected and blame the other party because, hey, like, you know, I wasn't able to do X, Y, Z because the Democrats or the Republicans or whoever on the other side didn't allow me to do that. But if you reelect me, I'm going to be able to do that in this next four year cycle. And then it just starts all over again. So it's kind of the same never ending thing with politicians here in the US. But at the end of the day, if they are just at least friendly to Bitcoiners, they set up friendly policies, they allow us to work and like do that. I think I was kind of talking about this. I'm, I'm going to drop this episode with Stefan Levera here in the, in the near future. But I think the, the US politicians might be. I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to be giving them too much credit, but they might be pretty smart here because the way that they're attacking it in the U.S. is they're attacking these custodial lightning wallets or non like non KYC lightning wallets, right? So it's like you look at Wallet of Satoshi, you look at Moon, you look at like all these different places. Like realistically, when I was just abroad, it's like what are the lightning wallets I have access to? It's like Strike and Cash App, really. 
Like, I mean, you could do Phoenix, but you got to balance the channels. It's a little bit harder. Um, you can do like some of these other uh, ones like Mutiny, but it's more of a web-based app and it's not necessarily like an app that you could get on the app store. So, I mean, there's a lot of great projects going on, but they're making it difficult to basically make it easy to transact uh, in Bitcoin, right? I mean, like, unless mm -hmm. you're making an online purchase, you're, they're making it tougher for you to go to your coffee shop and buy Bitcoin or buy coffee with Bitcoin. And I think, you know, if that's going to be the case, then what, what do you have your options as like, right? You have like, you can make it really difficult where it's like the average Joe Schmo is not going to, um, you know, download these, the Phoenix based, uh, or the Phoenix wallet and know how to balance for channels or do anything like that. And then, uh, two, like, you know, the on-chain transactions are just going to keep our on-chain fees are just going to keep going up. So on-chain fees or on-chain transactions just aren't going to make sense to purchase a coffee. And so the on-chain fees, who can weather those storms? Probably traditional finance, right? The big boys. And then, uh, you know, from the lightning transactions, the little guy gets crushed. So if they want traditional finance to come in and take over Bitcoin, which, you know, very well, I mean, I guess tinfoil hat in it here, they very well could with the, the rate that they're buying. Um, you know, they're, they're making it very difficult for us to kind of like move that that industry aspect of it forward, which if you're sitting here rooting for the dollar, I guess that that's a, a smart way to, to, to do it. But at the end of the day, we all know Bitcoin's inevitable that it's going to win. It's just they're, they're putting a few roadblocks in front of us here that we're going to have to try to find our way around. Yeah, well said. Holy cow. I know we're getting toward the end here. Another one. I want to ask you one more thing kind of here, and then we'll do a little, uh, a little new segment, a little word association. Right. Then I'm going to start doing have you ever Have you ever seen uh, Caleb Presley's uh, Sunday Conversation with Barstool Sports? Oh, man, I missed your question. You you went in oh. and out for a second. No, no worries. Have you seen um, Caleb Presley's Sunday Conversation on Barstool? Oh, yes, of course. Big sure. fan, big fan of Barstool, big fan of uh, Caleb. Yeah, so we'll do, <laughs> I always think of the, we're going to do a new segment by, sponsored by Mamitas. <laughs> I always, yeah. I always think of that. So I'm going to, I'm going to start doing that. Actually, I have the first 33 episodes. I have not done that, but I'm going to start doing this little word association game with everyone at the end. So I gotta, I just, I was just thinking about it. It's like, I gotta do that. Anyway, uh, before we do that though, to, uh, kind of cap it all off, what, um, you mentioned, you mentioned something here and it made me think of capitalism. You know, you have this, this pendulum of capitalism in, in swinging to the other side of socialism, communism, and, you know, it just seems like every single time you have capitalism and it gets destroyed by, uh, you know, it's got to be built on something and that monetary foundation. And when the money's corrupted, now you've got this, this, this capitalism, you've got this structure built on sand and it just evolves into socialism, communism. And like you were saying, what made me think of that was we've already gone too far. Like, I don't think you can, you can't win in the system as Jeff Booth always says, right? Like you can't fix reality from the current system. Like you have to build a new system. And I think like, what are, I guess, what are your thoughts on that? But also like, what, like, how do we, is it just pain? Like my, my father always said like pain's a great teacher, you know, like, and it's just like, do we really have to go through this pain and like this, this suffering in order for, for people to wake up again for the billionth time? Like what, what are, please give me some good news here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think like at the root of it, right? Capitalism is good, right? I mean, you right. provide a good service for me. I find value in it, right? It's like value for value. Yep. That's, yep. you know, capitalism at its core. I think we've kind of gotten away from that because of the way that the, the fiat currency has, built um, you know, in yeah. a sense, just kind of been diluted and inflated away. So, um, you know, I think like, you, you know, we, we could still get back to the, the capitalism roots, I guess. I just think that, you know, where we're kind of at is we're, we're at, we're at a country right now that we're, we've probably never been more divided than we are right now. Right. I mean, it was the whole, like maybe 2020 was the most dividing kind of point in time. And we've maybe gotten a little bit closer since then, but it's like, you know, the fiat currency kind of, uh, encourages crisis is kind of the, the way I like to, to uh, word it, right? I mean, if you think about it, COVID pandemic, who makes all the money there, right? The big pharmaceutical companies. So if you're in the big pharmaceutical companies, you're making out like a bandit. 
who uh, profits in war? Always defense companies, right? I always think of the movie War Dogs with uh, Jonah Hill and My Miles Teller, right? I mean, when a war breaks out, they're like, oh, shit, they see dollar signs. You know, so, you know, that and to me, that's not necessarily like true capitalism. True capitalism is like, all right, like, you know, Brandon, you guys provide the, the, these great uh, trading cards. Like, I think that this is worth, I don't know, 100,000 Satoshis, or I think this is worth you know, X amount because, you know, I find the value of it. It brings me joy. So I will be willing to pay you X amount. Um, and so I think like, you know, if we kind of what, what Bitcoin encourages is us kind of getting back into that. Um, you know, I don't think we're really there yet with the value for value aspect of things. But I think like, you know, when it comes to like pricing and like everything like that, the closer we get to more of the denominating and like the kind of the Satoshi's aspect of things, I think that's when we'll we'll get to stuff and you know it's kind of like a slow slow and steady progression when we get there right I mean like I have a a video editor guy that uh Luke Mickich so shout out to Luke he does great editing for a lot of my podcasts and stuff like that but he uh has denominated his uh you know what I pay him every single month in satoshis so like you know 6 months ago it was great when I started working with him I was like ah oh, this isn't bad now it's a little <laughs> he's a little bit more expensive for sure. But I mean, it's kind of like, you know, came with the territory in, in like, you know, uh, denominating in that. And so like, you know, obviously I've grown since then and whatever, and he's, he's a hundred percent worth. I pay him, you know, I'm probably underpaying yeah. him too. So, I mean, uh, shout out to Luke and everything he does, but I think like, you know, the pain that we have to experience, like one, I think it's, it's, it is a teacher, right? I mean, I think like, if you kind of take a step back to, from that, like, all Bitcoiners, right? We all shit coined at some point in time, right? I mean, like I admitted it here, like I traded Doge a little bit, like majority of Bitcoiners probably shit coined. How did I get like, I, of course, I made a little bit of money in Dogecoin, but I didn't make enough to get hurt. A lot of people lose money yeah. when they shit coin. Uh, yeah. Majority, I would probably say, right? They all get rugged, right? Um, and so what does that mean, right? You either one, like learn why you got rugged, learn what from your mistakes or two, like you disband cryptocurrency and you conflate Bitcoin with all that. And you kind of just, you know, group all those things together. So, uh, you know, it, it really, I think it just takes like a certain kind of person to, to kind of like learn from their mistakes or like really be curious. And I think like, you know, some people, it they just don't even want to care about money or anything like that. So I think, you know, at the end of the day, it really just depends on the type of person, either like one, you're probably going to have to suffer so, so much pain that you actually start to, to look into it. Um, or two, like you're kind of like going to play around with some things and get curious or three, like you're just kind of going to be naturally drawn to something like, like Bitcoin, whether it's, you know, you're in the energy business or you're in like, you know, the computer science aspect and like those things kind of appeal to you. I think it's just kind of like, looking at it from the three different cogs I, I like to put out in Bitcoin, where it's like the philosophical aspect of money, the energy side of things when it comes to mining, and then the like development side of things when it comes to like the layer twos or threes. So I think, you know, to kind of get somebody into and onboard Bitcoin, it's like you have to kind of figure out where they're at in that aspect of things, like what, what would be resonate with them more. And then from there, you know, once that you kind of figure that out, then, then you can kind of see how receptive they are. But majority of the time of things like, you know, it's the price, right? I mean, we're going to get probably more uh, text and phone calls in the next like six months about Bitcoin <laughs> than we've got in the past like year and a half. So true. Good stuff, brother. Well, uh, before I let you go here, I want to do new segment as Caleb would do a new segment presented by Bitcoin trading cards. So how about that? There we go. Word, word association. So the first thing that comes to your mind when I run through this list here for you. Michael Saylor. Oh, uh, I don't know, man. I, I, I've, I've been trying to, so I've been trying to come up with a good nickname for him. So I'm going to say hard money, Mike. Oh, I like it. Uh, cold storage. Ooh, security. Politics. Whoo. Oh, that's a tough one. Um, Fugazi. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Fiat. Dying. Normie. Oh, um, sheep. Women in Bitcoin. Oh, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love it. Peter Schiff. 
Uh, hard headed. Vitalik Buterin. Ugh. Uh, manipulator. Jack Mollers. Ballers. Love that. Uh, macro. Ooh, uh, cracks. Ooh. Wizards. <laughs> oh, man. Um... I don't know. I I was just going to say, with Wizards, I always think of my buddy Bitcoin Gandalf, so I'll just say Gandalf. I like it. I like it. Uh, Bitcoin trading cards. Oh, uh, the new wave. Satoshi Nakamoto. Genius. And lastly, Green Candle. Ooh, on the rise. Let's go. (laughs) Dude, appreciate <laughs> yes, you, brother. Sir. Appreciate it so much, Brandon, for coming on. And uh, this is a blast. And I appreciate you indulging me in the new segment presented by <laughs> Bitcoin Trading Cards. <laughs> of course, <laughs> Jen. Of course. <laughs> appreciate it. But where can, uh, where can people find you at? <clears throat> yeah. Um, so people can find me. I'm at Green Candle IT on uh, X, Instagram, or TikTok. Uh, I know it might be a little cringe, but I'm, I'm everywhere. Uh, trying to spread the word of uh, Bitcoin there. You can find like my podcast. I got State of Bitcoin and Macro Insights wherever you got a uh, podcast. Or if you just want to go to one central location, you can search Green Candle on YouTube. And uh, yeah, I upload them there. So uh, check out all my stuff. And uh, yeah, subscribe to this one, man. Subscribe to, to the great stuff that my uh, fellow Brandon is doing over here and uh, the great stuff that they're doing at Bitcoin trading cards, follow along and, and scoop up some packs. I got one of these packs here sitting with me. We're show, we're showing them pre-show. So I I'm coming strapped with my Bitcoin trading cards. Are you? Let's go. Appreciate it. There brother. we go. Thank you for checking out this episode of the playable characters show brought to you by Bitcoin trading cards. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any of the future Bitcoin and financial experts we have on the show. Plus, we will be doing random big giveaways throughout different moments of shows, of collectible cards, sats, merch, and more from guests so you won't not miss anything. This show does not constitute any investment advice, only freedom advice. Everything you see here is opinions from the hosts and the guests themselves, nothing further. Please don't trust, verify. For full transparency, I do lead marketing efforts at Bitcoin Trading Cards where we are trying to spread freedom to all of humanity and orange pill the world one collectible physical trading card at a time by making things fun and easy to talk about that normally make you want to cry. You can reach me directly through my email, brandon at btc-cards.com with any inquiries or playable character suggestions. See you on the next one.